I think many of us are believers in the stablecoin market, right? As a bridge between traditional finance and decentralized finance, stablecoins, I think, play a very important role. Uh, the, the, the market itself today, as I think we all have seen, is about $150 billion. Yes. Uh, the US dollar stablecoins by far is the, the dominant. Uh, you know, some, and certainly I'm one of these players, believes that that market at $150 billion today, you know, it's forecast to be somewhere around two and a half to three trillion in about four or five years. Yes. So that's a 20x growth. Uh, I think there's going to be a bunch of different players, uh, and I look. I think Tether's going to continue to do well. Circle's going to continue to do well. Uh, I think there's a role for Ripple to play in that, given our focus on the kind of infrastructure level. Uh, and look, I also think, and we wouldn't do this unless we thought it was going to be very good to the XRP ledger. Uh, as you have seen stablecoins launch on other layer ones, you've seen liquidity in that layer one grow. Our, our goal as much as anything is to grow liquidity in XRP Ledger. So we think view this as a good opportunity for Ripple, but an even better impact on the XRP Ledger. Hey, hey, everybody, it's Eddie from Tokyo. This is your cryptocurrency update from Japan. That was Brad Garlinghouse. And yes, Tether is going to continue to do well and circles going to continue to do well. In addition to that, he highlighted the developers. It's not about the 100,000 developers already working on Web3, it's the 20 plus million developers who are yet to work on Web3 that's truly exciting. This industry is not going away and it's events like Paris Blockchain Week that keep growing for this reason. And the biggest compelling reason for getting into the stablecoin market, USD Tether produced an estimated 6.2 billion in net income in 2023. That's 78% of the number that Goldman Sachs brought in. They have 49,000 employees, Tether has 100. Make no mistake, Ripple is going after the builders. They have a new grants rolling application for a process that's aimed to speed up everything to tap into that 10 to 200,000 that they hand out. Apply anytime now and you'll see new judges for 2024. They're looking for projects that range from DeFi to security, tokenization, sustainability and gaming. If you're interested, they have a live info session on April 23rd. Something a little bit concerning, in about 23 hours, the new AMM fix upgrade will take place. 196 nodes still need some work to go. This is going to go live, and if they don't upgrade, they're going to be blocked. Something very cool coming out of Flare Networks today, they're going to get a DEX. That's a decentralized exchange. It's called Raindex. It'll be a new desktop app to offer advanced trading operations of centralized exchanges. You can set bid and offer prices, activate stop losses, fully permissionless. Wow, decentralized on chain. You can write a smart contract to sell assets at a set price triggered by the Flare Oracle. It's done through a matching venue for the trade. And if you can read or write Excel formulas, that you can then easily create a smart contract. There's going to be a trading contest in May with a pool of 12,000 US dollars. This is where we're at in the Flare drops. You can see April 10th, and we're still lots of drops to come. I'm loving how things are compounding. Wow, I just am so bullish on Flare. We do have someone who is really on top of everything and that's Congressman Tim Scott of South Carolina. He pushed back on a narrative today that was just disgusting from Senator Elizabeth Warren. I'm gonna let both of them take you out. Until next time, do take care. Sayonara for now. Bye-bye. How is it right now that Hamas has access to money or, or some form? 
they're of, of financing for themselves. They are um, increasingly, in my view, turning to alternative means of financing, given what we've done in terms of their ability to do the traditional financial system. So, so what does that mean, alternative means of financing? One of those is cryptocurrency. And cryptocurrency is a means that uh, while we're using every tool we have, we need additional tools to go after. OK. And it's, it's not just Hamas and terrorists that are using crypto financing. North Korea, ransomware gangs, drug traffickers, distributors of child sexual abuse materials. Name your bad guy. And crypto is the way that they can move money around. Now, your letter that you sent to Congress follows a basic principle. Activities with similar functions and similar risks should follow similar rules. So I want to look at an example of that. I want to look at one of the middlemen examples, validators. So validators are the middlemen between the payor and the receiver. And they help process crypto transactions. In the traditional banking world, if a bank transacts with somebody who's laundering money, then they are break, breaking the law. But validators in the crypto world don't have that same set of rules. Are there crypto validators right now that are processing transactions for North Korea and pocketing a fee for each of those transactions? There's same for Hamas, same for drug lords and child traffickers. There's reporting that I am familiar with that's public about the fact that those threat actors that you've mentioned are conducting that type of activity. OK, so bad guys can use crypto right now because we don't have the right rules to keep them out. But I think it's worse than that. We know, for example, that Iran, one of Hamas's biggest funders, makes millions of dollars validating transactions for others that have no connection to Hamas or Iran. So if I wanted to send $1,000 worth of crypto to you, Mr. Secretary, is it possible that when I just send it, just uh, to send this, that Iran could be our validator and would be collecting a fee processing our crypto all of that without either one of us knowing it? So under a transaction like that is certainly possible. OK, so Iran, which is subject to all kinds of sanctions, is moving money through crypto and actually making millions of dollars validating crypto transactions for Americans and for everyone else, all because we don't have the right anti-money laundering rules in place. One more quick question. If the crypto market grows, and the number of crypto transactions increases, does that mean more money would likely end up in Iran's pockets? Everything that we've seen says that when markets grow, threat actors use them more, and we should expect that that is what would happen here as well. OK, and more activity, more money. You know, currently, the House is working on a bill to create a regulatory framework for stable coins. Stable coins make it easier to convert dollars into crypto and crypto into dollars. So they are an on-ramp into the crypto world. If we're going to create new on-ramps, increasing traffic, which is exactly what the House bill does, then we need a regulatory framework that will put the rules for anti-money laundering in place so that we do not have more opportunities for Iran and terrorists and drug lords and human traffickers to make more money. We've got to get those AML rules in place. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Listening to you today, Deputy Secretary, it feels like digital assets has become the scapegoat of this administration because with all that's going on in the world, the only legislative requests you have sent to this committee are new authorities related to cryptocurrency. And I will say that if China buys about 90% of the Iranian oil and we make it easier to sell the Iranian oil, if in last August we saw a $6 billion transfer to the Iranians for, in my opinion, hostage relief, $10 billion allowing electricity waivers, none of that's happening in digital assets. They're literally using our cash. We're making it easier for them to use euros. The, the bottom line is this, that if $35 billion represents the export of oil from Iran, none of which is purchased using digital assets, Having a conversation simply and exclusively about digital assets 
misses the elephant in the room, that every single time we make it easier for the Iranian regime to receive resources from the United States in cash, pallets of cash, or through electricity waivers, use euros or license, we put more and more Americans and our allies in harm's way, and that includes Israel. Uh, and so for us to have a conversation that sounds like a digital asset conversation, as opposed to a conversation about illicit financing that is far larger than digital assets, to me, makes it into a scapegoat.